Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Coronavirus History, Biology, and Innate Immune Antagonism. This webinar is part of the Coronavirus Virtual Event Series. And I'm Susie Valdez of Labrits, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots. So let's get started. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type it into the question box and click send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, just click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers continuing education credits tab. Click on the continuing education credits tab located on the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain those credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Susan Weiss, Professor and Vice Chair of the Department of Microbiology and Co-Director at Penn Center for Research on Coronaviruses and Other Emerging Pathogens at Perlman School of Medicine in the University of Pennsylvania. For a complete biography of our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Weiss, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. So I have a, a sort of abbreviated title now, Coronavirus is Old and New, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover the same topics that Susie just mentioned. So uh, my talk's gonna be divided into two parts. The first part's gonna be a basic discussion of the biology of coronaviruses. And I think that's important to understand because it helps us identify steps in the viral life cycle that may serve as targets for antivirals that will be um, effective against uh, both the cor cor coronaviruses that we know about and any future coronaviruses. The second part of the talk is gonna be about an, an, the antagonism of the innate immune responses by coronaviruses. And this is really important also because during early infection, coronaviruses are really good at shutting down host interferon responses and, and other similar other pathways, related pathways. However, during later infection, uh, cytokine production becomes part of the pathology as we all heard about these cytokine storms. So uh, my lab has had a long-term interest in understanding the interaction of uh, coronaviruses with, with these pathways. So let me get started. Uh, okay, here's the coronavi coronavirus virion. It, it has a now familiar morphology, I think. This is in the electron microscope uh, shown here. Here's the virus particle with this uh, characteristic crown-like morphology formed by the spike proteins that I'll talk about in a moment. So coronaviruses are a, mem are a family within the nidovirus order. They're named for the nested set of subgenomic mRNAs generated during infection. Um, oops, I have to get used to how this works. Um, Here's a picture of the coronavirus particle, uh, a cartoon. So he, the coronaviruses have this very long RNA with a cat 5 prime end and polyadenylated 3 prime end. It looks like a, a typical eukaryotic messenger RNA. And this long protein, this long RNA is, is wrapped up with a nucleocapsid protein into this helical structure shown here called the nucleocapsid. The nucleocapsid is surrounded by a membrane that's derived from the host cell. Um, and in that membrane, there are three proteins the spike protein, which most people have heard about now. And the spike protein is really important in that it, it moderates uh, viral entry um, and it, it, it's responsible for binding and fusion of the, of the host and viral membranes during entry. It's also an important determinant of tropism, immune response and virulence, although not the only determinant. The other two proteins in the viral membrane are the membrane protein and the small membrane protein, M and E, <clears throat> shown here, and they also have important roles in viral assembly. Um, some coronaviruses also encode a, a hemagglutinin esterase, which is kind of homologous to uh, influenza HA. That, that protein is not present um, in SARS coronavirus and, and related uh, lineage B coronaviruses. Um, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of coronaviruses. So they've been around for a really long time. They're not new in 2019 or even in the year 2000. The coronavirus uh, research dates back to the... Uh, to the 60s and late 60s and 70s. And I'm gonna call the era since then uh, an era of study of the MHV, mouse hepatitis virus, as a model coronavirus. There are studies of many animal coronaviruses, mostly often focused on vaccine development. 
And there were also human coronaviruses known back from, since that time. So the first coronaviruses we hear about in the literature are OC43 and 229E. They both cause the common cold, although OC43 can also cause a little bit more serious disease in the lower respiratory tract. And during the uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s, really, there was a lot of research done on basic coronavirus biology. And it was because of this that when SARS emerged in 2002 in, um, in, uh, in southern China and started the, path the era of what I call the pathog pathogenic human coronaviruses, it was very quickly identified and characterized because of all that we had known uh, from the basic biology of studying these, these other uh, model viruses and animal viruses. Um, so SARS uh, emerged from uh, bats and transmitted through civets into humans. It infected about 8,000 people, but only lasted about eight months because patients that had SARS were easily identified and isolated. Um, and, and the epidemic really was, in, in retrospect, was really quite short. Um, and in the wake of SARS, um, the SARS epidemic, people looked for more human coronaviruses and, and identified HKU1 and NL63, HKU1 causing pneumonia and NL63 causing bronchiolitis and croup. And another notable thing after the SARS or in the wake of the SARS era was that we, we really began to understand that there were many, many coronaviruses in bats as well as other types of viruses. Um, and then things were pretty quiet into, until th 2012 when MERS coronavirus emerged in the Middle East. Um, and MERS is still causing infections. It, it infects people at a much lower rate. It, it's transmitted, it was transmitted from bats into camels where it has a reservoir um, and then slowly into humans. It's not as contagious as SARS was. Then things again were quiet until 2019 when, as we all know, at the end of the year, uh, a SARS coronavirus emerged in a different part of China um, and caused this worldwide pandemic that we're all living with right now. So just to be specific, SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2 all cause severe respiratory disease, and, and SARS-CoV-2 causes coronavirus disease 19 or COVID-19. So it's sort of like HIV and AIDS, SARS-CoV-2 virus causes uh, COVID-19. Just one more thing on the timeline. Um, the first coronavirus meeting met in Würzburg, Germany in 1980. I was actually at that meeting. I had just started my lab. There were only about 60 people there, which was probably most of the field. Uh, the 10th meeting met, met in the Netherlands in 2003, and there were hundreds and hundreds of people at this meeting as it was just after the SARS um, epidemic. And finally, we were supposed to have the 15th international meeting, now called the NIDOVIRUS meeting in the Netherlands in 2020, but it had to be postponed due to the pandemic. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about coronavirus genome structure. So um, all these, these are showing the different lineages of coronaviruses that encode, that include human viruses. They're alpha coronaviruses, 229E and NL63, and the beta coronaviruses. There are three lineages, A, B, and C, now called Mbeco, Sarbeco, and Merbeco. Um, and these include OC43, HKU1, and, and the murine coronavirus that I'll talk about in a moment that we've worked on a lot in my lab. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, CoV, and MERS-CoV. All of the coronaviruses have this very long uh, replicase locus that encodes 16 non-structural proteins, which I'll talk about in more detail, um, and then the structural proteins in the same order, spike E, M, and N. Um, and then what makes these genomes different is that uh, uh, these uh, small non-structural proteins, well, I should say, before I get into that, SARS-CoV-2 was easily identified as a, as a Sarbeco or lineage B virus by its homology with SARS-CoV. Um, and this part of the genome is very different among all the different lineages, and I'll talk about this in a lot more detail at the end as well. These small open reading frames tend to encode um, host antagonist uh, uh, activities. Okay. So um, I'm going to give a really short, very simple uh, model of coronavirus replication. It's much more complicated than this, but uh, just, to, just for the main points, uh, the virus, uh, the spike protein recognizes its receptor on the host cell membrane. It then mediates um, a, a fusion between the viral and host membranes, releasing the nucleocapsid into the cytoplasm. The, the, the RNA, the genome, is translated into a replicase protein, which then makes uh, amplified as genome RNA shown here, and also transcribes a set of subgenomic messenger RNAs. Each one of those RNAs is translated into a protein. The, the membrane proteins assemble on intracellular membranes shown here, the S, M, and E, 
um, and the nucleocapsid protein complexes with new genome, and then buds into this intracellular compartment, the um, intermediate compartment between the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi, and then is found in vesicles shown here and transported to the cell surface where it's extruded from the cell. Um, and spike protein is deposited on the membrane shown here, and it mediates a cell-to-cell -cell fusion, which I'll show a little bit about uh, more about later. So I want to talk about several steps in the viral life cycle, several common steps to all coronaviruses. Um, I'm missing here. We're going to talk about entry, but then genome, MR, uh, genome and mRNA synthesis, and then translation of conserved replicase proteins. So uh, viral coronaviruses entry cells uh, by two routes. Um, either the plasma membrane route shown here, direct at the membrane. In this case, um, the viral, uh, after the virus uh, spike interacts with its receptor, which in the case of SARS-1 and SARS-2 is angiotensin converting enzyme shown here. Um, and once that happens, a cellular a cell plasma membrane associated protease cleaves the spike protein, which activates it to mediate fusion between the host membrane and the viral membrane that's shown here, and the nuclear capsid is released into the cytoplasm. Um, by the second route, which is a um, endosomal route, the, again, it's initiated by the viral spike recognizing its receptor. Uh, the viral particle is endocytosed into an endosome where, it, where it's in a low pH environment, which, uh, which activates uh, cathepsin, another protease, to cleave the spike to activate fusion. Again, there's a fusion between the viral and the, this time the endosomal membrane and the nucleocapsid is released into the cytoplasm. So the big question is, how is it determined which route is used? Well, it's a combination of what uh, proteases are available on the cell surface shown here, tempers for an example, what's in the endosomes, cathepsin for an example, and also there, is, there are intracellular proteases such as furin, which um, can cleave the viral spike protein as it's being uh, synthesized so that when the viral virus is produced in its, in its uh, host cell, um, it comes out already partially cleaved and ready uh, for viral entry. So I want to give an example from the MHV system, system, the marine coronavirus, how this works, because not only does it depend on the, uh, the proteases, but it also depends on the sequences in the spike protein. So all coronavirus spike proteins have two subunits, S1 and S2. This is just a JHM, one of the strains of mouse hepatitis virus. Um, there have to be two cleavages in order for the spike protein to mediate fusion one at the S1, S2 border and one at the S2 prime border. The one at the S2 prime border reveals a, 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 um, a hydrophobic peptide that uh, actually promotes the, the um, viral to cell fusion. Um, so some, virus, some viruses encode what's called a furin site. That's a site for cleavage by the protease furin at the S1, S2 border. So a, a virus like that, such as JHM, um, has this uh, purin site, and it and the viral pro the spike protein is completely cleaved during during assembly of the virus, and this virus enters the cell only by the direct plasma membrane route. A closely related virus strain called MHV2 uh, lacks a furin site, is uncleaved, and enters the cell through the endosomal route. And a third related strain called uh, A59 has a kind of partial cleavage. It has not quite as good a furin site, which is really just a run of basic, basic amino acids. Um, so this virus enters the cell by both routes. So, um, and all of these viruses are perfectly pathogenic. So in the MHV system, a furin site is not necessarily needed for pathogenesis. Um, so, I, and I, why is this important? It's, in, it's important because in, in uh, thinking about inhibitors, uh, an inhibitor such as chloroquine or another agent that lowers the pH of the endosome would only be effective against viruses entering by the endosomal route, whereas a protease inhibitor, for example, camostat, which inhibits tempers too, would only be effective by this route. So since um, a vi any given virus can enter different cell types by different, cell by different routes or by both routes sometimes, it's really important to, to, to consider that um, what inhibitors will actually be effective. Uh, chloroquine will not be effective against a virus that enters by the plasma membrane, for example. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to transcription of coronavirus RNA. So here's the genome RNA. It's, uh, as I said, very long. It's got a five prime cap and three prime polyadenylate, about 100 or so nucleotide so called leader sequence, and then these transcriptional rep regulatory sequences here that denote the beginning of each uh, messenger RNA. <clears throat> So, trans so 
RNA synthesis begins by translation of an RDRP or, or an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which then copies the, the genome RNA into a negative sense antigenome, which is then copied back into more genome RNA. So that's replication. At the same time, the virus transcribes a set of subgenomic um, negative sense uh, RNAs. And the way this happens is that transcription initiates at the three prime endogenome to here, once it reads the TRS, the viral uh, polymerase, the RDRP with the nascent chain jumps up here and continues uh, transcribing here to make this very short RNA. Sometimes that TRS is missed and then the, the, uh, the jump from trans of transcription, transcribing RNA comes from this TRS to the five prime end of the genome until all of these mRNAs are made. This is um, the model for urine coronavirus, but it's really the same for SARS or any other coronavirus. And then um, these subgenomic RNAs are transcribed back into plus strand messenger RNAs for, uh, for translation. Um, and one of the uh, things to learn from, from understanding how these RNAs are transcribed, it tells us something about these RTQPCR detection of coronavirus RNA that's commonly used for the, for the so-called COVID test. So here's an old gel from 1983 that demonstrates the RNAs of, of coronavirus. Here's the, uh, the NR, the smallest RNA is always the most abundant and there's less and less as they get larger. Um, so most, many of these tests amplify a, a portion of the replicase or the RDRP shown here as a test for, uh, for uh, coronavirus. But some of the tests can also amplify at the end gene shown here. So the difference here is that while replicase represents only the genome RNA, amplification of sequences in the end gene represent all of the, all of the mRNA. So that if you use this um, as a test for virus, you're actually measuring both replicating virus as well as genome and actually should be more sensitive if the virus uh, in these clinical samples or in these testing samples is actually replicating, which we don't actually know. So you could actually, you could test whether uh, you were having replicate virus by looking at the ratio of amplifying an end sequence versus a replicate sequence. Okay, I'm going to go on now to translation. So each of these mRNAs is translated from its five prime N into one protein, usually occasionally two proteins from one mRNA. But um, the really interesting part of the genome is translation of the five prime N. So this is translated into these very large polyproteins from open reading frame 1A and 1B. They're called PP1A and PP1B, and they're eventually, they're eventually um, processed into 16 non-structural proteins. And the way this occurs, the translation of both of these polyproteins is via a frame shift sequence. So translation occurs from the five prime end, and when it reads this frame shift sequence, it at some um, frequency, it either terminates translation to, to produce PP1A, or at some frequency, it, um, it actually, it's, it sees this, the ribosomes see this pseudonaut uh, structure in the RNA, and they slip back one re reading frame, one, uh, yeah, one reading frame, and, um, and continue to translate through the end of PP1AB. -B. Um, and, and these are processed, as I said, during translation into these 16 proteins. Now, to look at these proteins more, uh, uh, carefully, and these are all conserved among all coronaviruses, these NSPs numbered 1 through 16, um, we, we, we see first uh, NSP3 encodes a papain-like protease that processes these two sites. Um, NSP5 encodes a 3-like, 3C-like protease, the main protease that processes the rest of the polyprotein. And then NSP12 encodes this RNA-dependent RNA, RNA, RNA polymerase um, that, that carries out replication of genome and transcription of mRNAs. And this, interestingly, is, um, is the target of remdesivir, which probably you've all heard about. And um, this is a good target because it's conserved, again, among all coronaviruses. And any inhibitor should work against all, all the RNA-dependent RNA, RNA polymerases. Um, lipinavir and retinavir have been uh, tested against the 3C-like protease. I don't think they're very successful uh, because they're, it's a very different protease than the, uh, than the original protease these were originate, originally designed against. Um, so in summary, uh, we have um, a proteases that process replicase proteins and the RDRP that replicates genome and transcribed RNA. But there are really a whole lot, oh, these are just, to, these are people that have actually been looking for inhibitors all this time, way before SARS-CoV-2. So I just wanted to acknowledge them there. 
Um, there are a whole lot more uh, uh, proteins, conserved proteins encoded in these open reading frames. Um, some of them are shown here. They're either uh, proteins that are part of the replicase complex, like a helicase, a primase. Um, but they're also, importantly, they're proteins that, um, that uh, antagonize host cell uh, responses. For example, there are three proteins involved in capping the mRNA, which protects it from host cell sensors. Um, and makes it look like a uh, like a cellular host RNA. There's also endou that prevents the accumulation of double-stranded RNA, and I'll show you in a little minute, in a minute or so, why that's so important. But again, it's against host cell responses. This XON is a proofreading enzyme that prevents the genome from accumulating too many mutations and becoming attenuated. Um, there are also, in addition, there are more antagonist activities encoded in NSP1 and NSP3. Um, so, in summary, from, uh, from this slide, these enzymes, there are enzymes to promote synthesis and stability of viral RNAs, capping of 5' prime ends of mRNAs, and protection from host cell sensors um, and interferon responses. And I just want to show in the next slide how this works, uh, an example of how this can work. So here's um, a, a structure of SARS-CoV, uh, the original SARS, NSP13, the helicase. And here are the predicted structures of MERS and uh, MHV NSP13s as well. And this was this is an inhibitor that was used against SARS-CoV, uh, SARS, the original SARS. And you can see that it fits into the binding pocket of all three of these um, structures of these NSP13s. And at the same time, this inhibitor, um, as we've shown here, as a function of increasing concentration, can prevent or reduce replication of both SARS, MERS, and MHV. So this is just one example of how uh, an inhibitor against one virus can be a, a pan-coronavirus inhibitor. And just to summarize this first part of the talk, um, I showed many conserved features of coronaviruses that can be potential targets for pan-coronavirus inhibitors, and these include subgenomic mRNAs, the non-continuous RNA synthesis, the ORF1A1B frame shifting, the proteases, the RNA, RDRP, and RNA modifying enzymes, and the further activities encoded in NSP1. There was a macro domain and a deubiquitinase. So now I'm going to really switch and, and to the second part of the talk. And, and, and this is something that's different among different coronaviruses, and that's antagonism of double stranded RNA induced antiviral pathways. And um, that is usually carried out it was by a combination of some of these conserved. Uh, non-structural proteins, but also these small open reading frames encoded in the three prime end of the genome. And um, we know a lot about, uh, I, I'm going to first describe what I mean by double-stranded RNA-induced uh, antiviral pathways, and then I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've done in my lab on MHV, so a lineage A virus, and uh, MERS coronavirus uh, lineage C. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about our, our most recent data on SARS-CoV-2. Um, there's much less known about the innate immune responses encoded or the antagonists encoded in the three prime end for these uh, lineage B or Sarbeco viruses compared to the other two lineages. So, um, so coronavirus double-stranded RNA induced antiviral pathways are shown here. So coronavirus or, or really any RNA virus or any virus enters the cell the genome is then replicated and transcribed. And in doing so, it generates double-stranded RNA that's shown here. And that's, that's um, sensed by several sensors or many sensors in the cell that, that as a danger signal, and it induces the um, signaling, these several signaling pathways, all with antiviral activities. So we have here the, the canonical interferon signaling pathway in which double-strand RNA is sensed by coronaviruses. It's MDA5 and not RIGI, which signals through MAVs to produce type 1 and type 3 interferons, which then signals through STATs to induce interferon-stimulated genes um, and cytokine responses. In addition, oligoadenylate synthetases in response to double-stranded RNA synthesize a small oligoadenylate, 2,5A, which catalyzes the dimerization and activation of RNA cell, which cleaves host and viral single-stranded RNAs, le leading to antiviral activity, as well as cell death and inflammation. And then PKR, the third, um, uh, the third pathway here, senses double-strand RNA. It autophosphorylates and dimerizes then uh, phosphorylating EIF2 alpha, which is the translation initiation factor, and this leads to translational shutdown, cell death, 
um, and inflammation. And just as well, um, inter both OASs and PKR are interferon stimulated genes, so activation of this pathway can superinduce these other two pathways as well. So now I'm going to first talk about um, uh, the work that we've done in our lab on uh, these so called 2 prime, 5 prime phosphodiesterases encoded in both. Uh, uh, the lineage A viruses in NS2 and the lineage C viruses in NS4B. Just interestingly, these are the only accessory proteins that are common to two lineages. In, in general, these lineage, these uh, interferon antagonizing proteins are, are completely lineage specific. So, um, so these were the first uh, antagonists we worked on, and they're, these are both members of, of these coronavirus phosphodiesterases are part of a large super family of 2-H phosphoesterases, which catalytic motifs of histidine X, serine threonine X, um, shown here is uh, they, they are encoded in different places in each of these genomes. So here NS2 is encoded in this part of the genome. And um, that's um, the case also for the human virus OC43. The lineage C viruses have this NS4B shown here. And the toroviruses, which are related nidoviruses, also encode a homologous um, phosphodiesterase shown here at the encoded at the end of the of uh, ORF1A. Um, and interestingly, here's an alignment of these uh, sequences of these phosphodiesterases, members of the League II uh, subfamily. And we can see here that there are host enzymes, ACAP7. And, um, and here's the MHV, the coronavirus enzymes. And the only other virus that encodes a similar protein are rotaviruses, which is re really kind of curious because they're a completely different kind of virus. So here are the two um, catalytic motifs shown here. Otherwise, they're not highly conserved. So um, here's, I'm going to talk about MHV NS2 now. So NS2 is, is a phosphodiesterase. It has these two catalytic histidines shown here. We knew before we started this project that it was a 30 kilodalton protein expressed in the cytoplasm, not essential for replication in tissue culture, nor for the central nervous system pathogenesis caused by MHV. So we were really perplexed about what this virus did, uh, what this um, protein did. And we were able to get from a colleague, Stuart Sedell, a wild type and mutant strain, uh, completely congenic. These are recombinant viruses, one with a mutation in NS2, which inactivated the enzyme. So we showed, we, we replicated, we compared replication of these viruses in, uh, in macrophages derived from uh, B6 mice, so these are wild-type mice. Um, and we can see here that while wild-type virus replicates, really this is a log scale up to about 10 to the 6 platforming units per unit per, per um, mil of uh, supernatant, the mutant virus replicated barely at all in these wild-type macrophages. However, when we compared replication in macrophages derived from, from uh, mice with a knockout of the RNA cell gene, the uh, virus completely recovered, the mutant virus completely recovered uh, replication. So looking at, uh, and we also, so looking at the, this is, here's this pathway again that oligoadenylate synthetase uh, produces 2,5A, which activates RNA cell to degrade um, RNA. And um, at, we can quantify 2,5A, that's this step of the pathway, using a FRET-based, um, indirect FRET-based assay shown here. So we see that in, um, in uh, wild-type infected cells, we see a small amount of 2,5A produced, whereas in mutant infected cells, we see quite a lot. We look at the actual uh, activation of RNA cell uh, by RNA integrity on what we call a chip assay in a bioanalyzer, and that's shown here. This instrument generates a kind of pseudogel, and we can see that in um, here's uh, mock infected cells. There's 28 and 18S ribosomal RNA, and in cells infected by wild type virus, we continue to see this uh, intact RNA. Whereas in mutant infected cells, we can see that the uh, ribosomal RNA now is degraded somewhat, and you can see all these bands shown here. So this is how we uh, we score um, activation of ribos of uh, RNA cell. We saw similar data in uh, our mouse model for hepatitis. We can see here we infect mice uh, intrahepatically. The virus replicates, peaking at about day five, and then is cleared by the T by the T cell response primarily. Um, but And when we looked at replication at day five, which is the peak of replication um, in B6 in wild-type mice, we see that wild-type virus replicates to about seven logs per gram of tissue. 
whereas mutant virus barely at all. However, in the RNA cell knockout mice, in the livers, we see robust replication of both viruses. We also see uh, quite extensive antigen staining in RNA cell knockout mice, whereas in wild-type mice, we see antigen staining only with the wild-type virus. And similarly, when we stain with, with H&E, we can see there's a path viral-induced pathology in the knockout mice with both viruses, but in the wild-type mice, only wild-type virus is able to cause any inflammation and, and necrosis. So um, I just, as, as a sort of uh, note, which is really interesting, that RNA cell antagonism is not required for replication and pathology in the brain while it is in the liver. As you can see here, if we infect the same mice, wild-type and mutant, with the same viruses, we see similar replication in the brains of these mice whether or not they have the um, NS2 activity or not. And here's just to show the liver. So in this model, we infect mice intracranially, but they infect both organs. And we see this difference in the liver that I showed you before, but nothing in the brain. And interestingly, this is we, we found out that this is likely because the, the level of OAS, um, of the oligodendrolate synthetase expressed in the brain is much lower than in the liver. And that we actually need a, a sufficient level of these um, of, this, of these proteins, of these sensors to activate the pathway. Um, and here's, we found that actually that was true for all the interference stimulated genes we looked at. The brain has really low levels of expression compared to the liver. Um, and that's probably to keep the brain from, from undergoing too much inflammation. And that's, we'll, we'll keep this in mind for later that the, that the um, activation of these pathways and the expression of these interference stimulated genes is quite dependent on cell type. So just so not only does NS2 antagonize RNA cell, but the MHV endo U activity encoded in NSP15, which is present in all the viruses, also antagonizes RNA cell. Here's endo U. Um, we were able to working with uh, Volker Thiel. We found that with a, again a wild type and mutant um, uh, NSP15 or endo U that. When we looked at replication in macrophages from mice again, we can see the same pattern we saw with the NS2 mutant, that the endo mutant is really unable to replicate efficiently. But this occurs by a different mechanism. So Volker Thiel and Susan Baker's lab showed that, um, that this endo U mutant actually generates a lot more double-stranded RNA than wild-type virus. And you can sort of see that here. It's not really quantified, but, um, but staining for double-stranded RNA, which is it, which is in green, is actually, uh, when we quantify it, is much more in the mutant than the wild type. But we more recently found, with, uh, in, a, in a collaboration with David Barton, which is in press now, that the viral RNA is actually cleaved by endo-U. It cleaves genome plus strand genome, and that's probably the mechanism by which uh, we have a re reduced amount of double-stranded RNA. And you can see here, there's some, this red stain is for the single-stranded genome, which is so much brighter in um, endo-U the mutant infected cells compared to wild type. So, um, and, and we could also see that the endo U mutant uh, activates RNA cells shown here. Here's intact RNA with the wild type and, um, and degraded RNA with the mutant. Um, however, this mutant does not recover replication in RNA cell knockout cells uh, because, uh, because it also needs to have the knockout of PKR. So this virus that this endo U mutant produces more double-stranded RNA activating both of these pathways. So we have to have cells from not knocked out with both of these pathways in order for the mutant to recover. So just to summarize here, we have um, the phosphodiesterases that uh, prevent this pathway from activating over here and the endo U that by a different mechanism reduces the amount of uh, genome RNA, which reduces the amount of double-stranded RNA, which shuts down or slows down all of these pathways. So I next want to talk about uh, MERS coronavirus. So MERS encodes two, uh, not, two inter interferon antagonists in NS4A, which is a double-strand RNA binding protein, and then NS4B, which again is a 2H diesterase. Although this time it's encoded, it's in, it has an NLS, a nuclear localization signal, and is localized to the nucleus, which was curious. Um, so we obtained mutants from Ralph Barrick's lab, one a delta NS4A, a delta NS4B, AAB, um, a mutant lacking this NLS sequence, and a mutant with a catalytic histidine um, mutated so that it's an inactive uh, phosphodiesterase.
We then looked at in uh, now in A549 human cells, respiratory tract derived human cells. Um, we looked at, uh, at RNA cell activation with wild type and mutant viruses, and we found that um, this is uh, using Synbis virus as a control, which robustly activates um, RNA cell, that um, the NLS mutant has no effect on uh, degradation of RNA cell, but, but um, the catalytic mutant now with an inactive NS4B does induce a bit of uh, RNA cell degradation, RNA degradation. Um, interestingly, the NS4A mutant, which is binds double-stranded, which um, is lacking the double-strand RNA bind mutant, binding mutant, we would have expected to activate this pathway, but it does not. Whereas the double, the NS4A B mutant does. So NS4A uh, uh, was surprisingly uh, deleting it was surprisingly had a surprisingly um, un, not a very robust effect. Now, there was a problem here in showing this slide that it somehow got lost in translation um, of the system. But what we found here was that uh, while Synbis virus robustly activates PKR phosphorylates that the band is missing, uh, NS4A also activates uh, PKR. Uh, but the, but the, uh, the wild-type virus does not. The mutant virus does. Um, Synbis virus also activates or phosphorylates PIF2 alpha, but we did not see that um, in, these, in the MERS-like viruses. You have to imagine the bands here that I can't show you. Um, yeah, that's shown here. Okay, so uh, we also looked at the uh, activation of uh, interferon lambda and beta and, I, and interferon stimulated genes in the presence uh, absence of these um, antagonists, and we found that while MERS activates or uh, induces interferon really, really weakly, you can see here um, the mutant viruses induced a bit more. These are the mutants lacking 4A and 4B. Interferon stimulated genes downstream of interferons are also pretty weakly activated. But again, the mutant virus more than the wild type demonstrating again, again that these are interferon antagonists. But just for comparison, we can see here that while interferons induced are maybe 50 fold at most, um, by interferons induced by Synbis virus to about 10 to the five fold over background. So, so these are really dwarfed uh, inductions compared to another virus like Synbis. So just to summarize this part again, again, we have the, the, the NS4AB in, uh, antagonizing here, the NS4A here, and uh, the endo-U mutant here. Um, and uh, yeah, so, I'm, so I wanna just review again what we know about interferon antagonists. So I've talked to you about this NS2 protein, NS4A and NS4B. And we know for, for SARS-CoV-2, we really don't know anything about the antagonists in this new genome yet. But just we know for, by analogy with SARS-1 that in SARS-1, this ORF6 protein interferes with nuclear translocation of STAT1. We don't know if SARS-2 protein does that because it is a, there are some differences. And there's an NS3B protein that's been suggested to be an interferon antagonist, but that's not really been demonstrated within an infectious virus, only by overexpression. So with that in mind, we wanted to, we've been looking at um, the interaction of SARS-CoV-2 with, um, with these pathways. Um, so, um, and we've used a variety of cell types because we know that, that these pathways are differentially activated in different cell types. And we also use Synbis virus as, as a kind of positive control. And we use MERS-CoV-2 as a kind of negative control, knowing that it induces so poorly. So um, first we looked at uh, SARS-CoV-2 and MERS infection of a nasal and epithelial derived cells. These are from patients. And we can see here in the red that's, that both viruses infect these cells. This is four different donor samples. Um, when we looked at replication of these uh, viruses, we see here that um, the, the black is SARS for different patients and the green is MERS, that SARS replicates somewhat better than MERS and over a longer period of time in these cell types. We then looked at induction of um, interferons and interferon stimulated genes, and we can see that, it, that in these cells they're induced rather weakly, shown here. Um, and uh, we did find that um, the, Interestingly, that we found undetectable levels in ACE2, of ACE2 receptor in these cells. The receptor is clearly there, but it illustrates that you don't need much receptor necessarily to infect cells. And there was very low MDA5 um, expression, which maybe is why we see such poor induction here. Um, the next cell type we looked at were um, 
were uh, stem cell derived induced uh, alveolar type two cells. This is the major cell type infected in the lung. And uh, we know it's an uh, alveolar type two cell by this um, surfactant protein C marker uh, shown here in the, in the red, reddish orange. Here's SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid protein in the green. And we can see that the cell type is again, robustly infected. Virus replicates to up to six logs of infection by two days after infection. Um, and when we looked at interferon stimulated genes and interferons, again, compared to SYNBIS, we see that generally there's pretty uh, poor expression, except for some reason, uh, OAS2 is expressed quite well in these cells. Um, we also looked at activation of RNA cell, which we failed to see in the cell type or in the nasal cells. Um, and here's a, a Western blot where we can see that, um, that in this cell type, we do see uh, phosphorylation of PKR and phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha, suggesting that the PKR pathway is quite well activated in the cell type, uh, surprisingly. And again, we see very poor expression of ACE2 in, in another primary cell type. We then went on to look at um, uh, cardiomyocytes, also uh, stem cell derived, and uh, they're shown to be cardiomyocytes by this uh, troponin T marker shown here in the red. Again, we see good um, infection shown by green expression of nucleocapsid protein. And this time we actually do see some cytopathic effect that we did see in the other two cell types. You can see there's some cell fusion here, which is typical of coronaviruses. Um, like three infected cells fuse. Um, we then looked at replication and again saw robust levels of replication. And finally, uh, we looked at ISGs and interference again. And again, we see quite weak induction um, but uh, and no RNA cell activation. And again, we see, um, we do see PKO phosphorylation and PIF PIF2 alpha phosphorylation here. So this pathway is again induced quite well in these cell types. And again, um, we see poor and poor act, uh, expression of RNA cell in MAVs, which may be why we see such weak induction of these um, pathways. And interestingly, we saw that in the infect in, in SARS infected cells, we saw a reduction of ACE2, which we actually did see uh, more robustly in um, in mock infected cells and synthesis infected cells. So from here, we went on to look at, um, at uh, oh, and I, I think I'll skip, I'll skip this slide. So uh, we also looked at infection um, of two cell lines that are, uh, to, that are uh, respiratory tract derived, CalU3 cells and A549 cells, which we had to transduce or transfect or transduce to uh, express the ACE2 receptor. And that's shown here that we infected um, both of those cell types and Vero cells as well. Vero cells are, are monkey cells usually used to produce uh, stocks of the virus. And we can see in the green that virus replicates in all three cell types. Um, the red is staining double-stranded RNA shown here as expected. It's actually perinuclear um, in the usual confirmation uh, seen for virus replication sites. And um, we can see very uh, extensive syncytia or cell fusion in these two cell types here, but not in the Vero cells. Um, and virus replicates well in all these cell types. Here's shown Vero cells and ACE2 cells, I mean, A549 ACE2 cells. And here are CalU3 cells. And you can see that we looked at replication of SARS-CoV-2, MERS, and the MERS mutant that I talked about before, the NS4A4B mutant. And we can see that the mutant replicates poorly compared to the wild type, and that SARS-CoV-2 replicates less well, perhaps because it activates some of these pathways that I'll show you in a minute. So we then looked at activation of uh, interferon messenger RNA and interferon lambda and the interferon stimulated genes by our goal by RTQPCR. And we can see that again, quite poor induction of these genes, but some um, interferon stimulating genes a little bit later in infection at the second, at the 24, at the 48 hours. And here's Synbus again, rep inducing to a much greater extent. Here we looked at uh, induction of, P of STAT, of phosphorylation of STAT, which we did not see, which might, it might uh, explain the poor induction. We also, then we looked at um, the same kind of uh, questions in uh, this CalU3 cells, and we saw something a little bit different. In these cells, we can see that um, SARS does induce interferon to some, and interferon lambda to a greater extent, and certainly a lot more than MERS is doing here. It's more similar to MERS uh, mutants, 
And the ISGs are not are induced early in these cell types, whereas it was much later pre, in the previous uh, cell type. And also, it induces uh, the ISGs to a much greater extent than MERS wild type, and even um, to some extent, a similar extent to the MERS mutant shown here. Um, and uh, when we looked at uh, this, again, this did not show up properly. We did see phosphorylation of STAT1 with both SARS-CoV-2 and the MERS mutants. So um, these data suggest that this SARS-CoV-2 is behaving more like a MERS mutant that's missing um, its antagonists. And then uh, we looked at RNA cell activation in both of these cell types, and we can see that RNA cell is activated by SARS-CoV-2 in both uh, the A549 cells and in the MERS, uh, the CalU3 cells. And again, it's more similar to the MERS mutant that activates a bit, um, and, and, and more so than MERS itself. And here's Synbis, which activates in those path in those cells as well. And then we can't, I'm sorry, we can't see this here, but, but in summary, that both SARS-CoV-2, it phosphorylates PKR and EIF2-alpha, very similarly, again, to the MERS mutant. You have to imagine that those bands are there. And then finally, I'm show one more. This is the last data slide. We also, we knocked out, uh, we, we produced knockout cells in these A549 cells uh, expressing ACE2. We knocked out uh, MAVs. Um, we knocked out RNA cell. We knocked out PKR in different cell lines shown. And this is just the Western blot to validate the knockout. Um, we then looked at replication of the virus in all of these cell types, and we can see that um, in the in the presence or the absence of RNA cell, the virus does replicate slightly better. It's not it's significant. It was statistically significant in three experiments, and we can see that the RNA cell knockout cells are a lot more cytopathic effect. Like the virus is actually growing better and killing the cells um, in the absence of RNA cell. And then shown here, um, this is a RNA cell activation in these different cell types, and as expected in the RNA cell. Act Knockout cells, we see no activation in the presence of Synbis or SARS-CoV-2, shown here. Um, and this is, uh, but we do see activation in the MAVs and the PKR knockout cells. And this is of interest because it shows that the MAVs, uh, MAVs uh, dependent signaling pathway, interferon pathway, is not required for activation of RNA cell. So this pathway can be activated quite robustly even when interferon signaling is shut down, um, sh shown by this MAVs knockout cells. So in conclusion, or just a summary of the data, um, we have these four NS2 and NS4B uh, antagonists knocking down this pathway or preventing activation. We have the NS4A double-strand binding protein uh, slowing these pathways down, but, not that, but loss of it is not very effective in activating pathways. We have the ORF6 from SARS-CoV-2 that works at this level. We don't know whether that's working at the level of sars this is SARS-CoV-1, I'm sorry, at SARS-CoV-2, because we do know that SARS-CoV-2 can promote phosphorylation of P-STAT, of STAT-2, STAT-1, sorry. And then we have the endo uh, uh, that really is present in all of these viruses and is, is, act, is preventing the, the, or slowing down the accumulation of double-stranded RNA. So the SARS-CoV-2 at least has this protein. I don't know that it's been shown yet to be active, but it most likely is by its sequence. So we still don't know really, uh, so we don't know really very much or anything about um, interferon antagonist proteins in SARS-CoV-2, but we have shown that it does seem to allow more activation of the pathways than the other two viruses that we've worked with. So in conclusion, coronaviruses enter the cells by two pathways. Uh, the pathway used depends on spike protein, on protease cleavage sites, and on host and, host and surface and intracellular proteases. Coronaviruses express numerous conserved host antagonists in the replicase locus, often enzymes. These are potential targets for antivirals that may be effective against most, if not all, coronaviruses. Lineage A and lineage C beta coronaviruses express accessory proteins that contribute to antagonism of activation of RNA cell, interferon signaling, and ISGs, as well as uh, PKR. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, like MERS, weakly induces interferons. However, SARS-CoV-2 lacks a PDE, a phosphodiesterase, and a double-stranded uh, RNA binding protein, <clears throat> and activates RNA cell, promotes phosphorylation of PKR and STAT in some cell types, of course. And these data suggest, then, that SARS is not as adept as MERS 
in shutting down double-stranded RNA-induced pathways. And finally, we speculate, does this, or we ask the question, does this have any contribution to the ability of SARS to spread uh, asymptomatically? Um, and I will stop. Oh, I want to acknowledge my lab. These are the members of current members of the lab. These are past members of the lab that have been really fundamental in setting up all this, all this MERS and MHV2 work. Um, and these are our many uh, important collaborators and our funding. And I just want to show how our lab has transmitted or transformed from looking like that to looking like that um, most recently. And um, I will stop here and take questions. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Weiss, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. And Dr. Weiss, I'm going to ask you to click on that. I think you just took it off. Perfect. Just click yes. on that. Ask a question box. Oh, mm -hmm. oh. Wait a second. Let me get rid of this. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, now I, okay. I don't Thank see the you. question. Okay. Oh, it's still it's echoing. Still... What's echoing? Oh. You hear the echoing? No. <laughs> I don't. Oh, there it stops. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, just click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. So let's get started. Dr. Weiss, we have quite a few questions already coming in. Okay. Which is exciting. Um, can we expect another coronavirus outbreak in the near future? And if so, how might we be able to prevent another coronavirus outbreak? Okay, so um, I don't know. Yeah, we can expect one. I, it, we have no idea when or where. I, 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 sh I often say this and I forgot. So. We only know of three, but there might have been a lot of other ones that we don't know about because they didn't cause such a they didn't cause people to die or a pandemic. So it actually may have crossed over quite a lot because we do know that there are a lot of coronaviruses in in bats. Um, and I don't know that. I mean, the way we can prevent it, I, I guess, is keeping the bats away from people. But but um, I think having an armament of antivirals would be incredibly important so that if we do get um, another outbreak, we have something to use before we get a vaccine. Thank you so much. And is there any neurological impact of the SARS-CoV-2 as in MERS virus? Okay, so there's uh, there's been a lot of talk about that. So we know that there are neurological complications or neurological symptoms in, in, in some fraction of patients. Um, and I and there's a lot of I mean my lab in fact is interested in this too but it, it's not really clear yet whether whether um, SARS-CoV-2 infection actually occurs in the brain or whether it's kind of a secondary infection of inflammation but there's there's something there and and uh, I think there are quite a lot of people that are looking at that now. Thank you very much. And again, I want to thank our audience members for these great questions. Does the source of interferon, the tissue or blood cells, dysfunctional? And is there an impact on the ISG response? Um, well, okay. So the paradigm is that during early infection, both in humans and in um, animal models, that 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 it, the viruses behave like what I just showed it pretty much shuts everything down, although SARS-CoV-2 doesn't seem to do it quite as well. And then there's some kind of dysregulation later where cytokines are kind of go crazy. And I think I'm, I'm trying to, it could be because during early infection in the human, there's a lot of virus replication. And then by the time someone is really sick in the hospital, the amount of virus that can be isolated is not so high. And it's then at that point that the cytokines take off. So I'm just speculating that maybe um, after infection, there's a lot of debris and, and RNA or proteins that, that, are, that can hang around and induce interferons and other cytokines. So yeah, I guess in that sense, there's some dysregulation. Thank you so much. And Dr. Weiss, in view of the sequence homology, do neutralizing antibodies toward SARS-CoV-1 and or MERS have neutralizing activity against SARS-CoV-2? Okay, so certainly not for MERS, I would say, because MERS is, is a different lineage. It's a, a different, it's more different. So SARS-1 and SARS-2 are more similar than is MERS. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not sure about SARS-1 and SARS-2. I, I would think that perhaps they would cross-react. Um, 
I always thought it'd be interesting to see if, if people that had SARS-1 would be immune to SARS, would have antibodies that would neutralize SARS-2, but I, I'm not really sure. I would think there will be some cross-reaction. But we never really developed vaccines for SARS-1. They were sort of developed and then kind of aborted when the virus went away. Mm. Thank you so much. We have time for a few more questions. Why are some patients infected by the SARS-CoV induced a poor interferon response and it, but then an increase in chemo um, kind storm? Well, I don't I don't know the answer to that. I would really like to know the answer. I would really like to know the answer to that, but I don't know. I think that's something people are certainly looking at. Definitely. Now, after immune system has been activated by SARS-CoV-2 and spike proteins have been cleaved by the proteins, are there additional targets for the spike protein that might contribute to the cytokine storm? I think we really don't know. Um, I, you mean like like once this, so so you were thinking maybe when the after the cell is lysed that it releases spike. I don't know. Spike proteins on the surface, it's going to be part of the, the lysis that'll be around. So I, I don't know the answer to that. I guess it's possible. Thank you. We have time for one more question. The parameters you studied with the in vitro cells, do they necessarily correlate with what occurs in vivo? No. So, the, so, uh, so I think from what I showed, and I'm sorry, I went through very quickly and I was missing some of those bands, but, but you don't see the same activation in in all the cell types even among the cell the um the cell lines and certainly among the primary cells but but i think that in vivo uh the the virus is going to encounter a lot of different cell types and so it's going to be different in different cell types so you can't translate from the from the cell lines directly to to the primary cells on the other hand each primary cell is going to be very different in terms of both entry, which pathway it enters by, and also which what level of ISGs or what kind of pathways are going to be responding. So, no, you're right. You can't really translate from one to the other. On the other hand, it's important. I think it's important to look at different cell types to see the variety of possibilities. Dr. Weiss, thank you for your presentation today. Would you like to provide any closing remarks before we go? Um, I'll, I'll make a couple. So I, I do think that... Um, sort of the question about whether they're going to be more. I think that it's that we have to be prepared for more. So I have several recommendations that we certainly need a vaccine, right, for this pandemic. We need to keep pursuing antivirals for um, for this virus and for future and, and future coronaviruses. And I think it's important to keep looking out in bats and finding out what really is what viruses are in bats because some of them look like they can really they can transmit to humans pretty readily and my last thing is kind of a, a wish list that um, we really have to keep uh, continuing to fund basic basic virology based understanding these viruses mm -hmm. because I mean I've worked on these viruses for 40 years and they've always been considered like who cares about them and um, we should have cared about them more so thank you Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Susan Weiss. Thank you so much for your presentation today. And before we go, I want to thank the audience for joining us for today and their interesting questions. And any questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker for the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand for six months up to March 2021 next year. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, be safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.